always lots of extraneous noise in the back. So if you can stay muted unless you want to ask a question. And Floris isn't right in front of his screen. So, um, you know, Floris, would you be able to see somebody put up their hand or something like that if they have a question? Or how would you like no, to I handle that? I'm, I'm actually not, not holding the, the camera, but my, uh, my camera woman, who is a very accomplished uh, winemaker herself, also uh, um, uh, the um, person behind the Pinot de Charlotte wines, i.e. Charlotte, my daughter, who is filming. So she will um, give me a, a gentle nudge or a kick in the something and, and, and tell me when the question is uh, about to pop up. Right. And the lovely thing about Zoom, everybody, is that you'll be able to unmute yourself and actually talk to Floris directly rather than just type in your questions like you can on Facebook Live. But uh, please be patient that if you do have a question to ask, if, if it isn't seen right away, we promise we'll get to all of them as, as this proceeds. And again, I wanted to, this, I think this is a terrific. We deliberately kept the numbers low. Uh, we thought about going to Digicast where you can only type in your, uh, your answers or your questions, if, uh, if, but we wanted it to be a more interactive piece for you. So without further ado, um, Mr. Florence Rimstra, Lemstra, yeah? <laughs> that, I, I actually spoke some Dutch with him. I don't know any Dutch, but we did that when he was here in Canada. Um, they bought their estate in 2007 and you've, they've made their family home and livelihood from there. And um, he, he's been with, uh, with Opimian since 2010. And we did a dry run of this the other day and I was actually able to open one of the 2009 Minervois, which was wonderfully fresh. Uh, and it was, it was just a, an amazing wine still. So I don't wanna take any more of Floris's time. So I've got my bottle, I hope everybody does. If you've got a bottle of, of the Minervois with you, I strongly recommend that you open it. And so that you've got, uh, you can drink along with Floris. We should call them call it the, that, huh? We should call it drink along with Floris. <laughs> okay, over to you, sir. Cheers. Oh, are are you um, muted? I don't hear you, Floris. I think you're muted. Ah, uh, I think it should be okay now. Can you hear me? Is it is it okay, Michael? Can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. So yes, we're set. What it's, this is what it's all about tonight. The Minervois, 2018. And we will that will be trying that and pulling it apart and then analyzing that. And while doing so, I'm going to take you a little bit along the center to tell you about how we made the wine and 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 how it came about. A little bit about the vintage and show you a little bit what it took to um, to get that wine into uh, into the bottle. So okay, sorry, I'm going to pour my little bit of uh, Chardonnay Domendo, although it was quite delicious and start putting in some Minervois. We're gonna start at the very, very beginning, which is where the grapes come in. Um, and in 2018, it was quite a wet spring and a, and a very hot summer. So quite a technical year. So to get the, the grapes through that spring because we couldn't work the vineyards when we wanted them because the vineyards were wet and the tractors got stuck. And, and, and then it was followed by this extremely hot summer, which um, actually ended up being a fairly early uh, harvest as a result. And so this is where the harvest starts. Um, this is our reception area. So the harvest is always done by night because, you know, imagine harvest, uh, eating a, a, an apple, taking a bite out of an apple, you put it in the sun and it will become brown very, very quickly. Well, that's oxidation for you. So if you put that apple in the fridge, it will not get as brown that quickly because it's cool. So by harvesting at night and bringing in the grapes sort of as of three o'clock in the morning, at the coldest time of the day, we protect them from oxidation in a natural way. And this is all done to try and avoid the use of sulfides to a maximum because sulfides are an antioxidant and when the grapes come in here they go through this torture machine okay Charlie you might not want to go too far because you might run out of wi-fi network so this is the destemmer so when the grapes come in they go into this big bin they are weighed and then they go through the stemmer where we take the stalks off the um, grapes because 
the stalks have this bitter green astringent taste that we don't want in our wine. So it takes the stalks away that go in there and the grapes come into this pump. And normally in a normal uh, average estate, this is where you have to start protect, protecting the grapes with, with sulfites and antioxidants. And by harvesting at night and also by using different process, processes in the cellar, we don't use any sulfur at this, this stage to, to, to keep the grapes from, um, from um, um, uh, oxidizing. We use specific kind of yeast cells that, that protect them. Um, and therefore we are a lot less reductive and also a lot less uh, headache free because obviously a lot of uh, sulfites also will, uh, will, will, will have an effect if you drink one bottle one, we actually don't want you to drink one bottle, we want you to drink two or three bottles. So this is where the grapes come in, they are de-stemmed, go into this pump and they go into this big hose um, into the press. And what we do here is that we use nitrogen. I was talking about lack of sulfides, it's because we replace that by nitrogen. Nitrogen is an inert gas and it takes oxygen out of the air. So when we fill all the pipes, the press, the vet with nitrogen, we don't have to um, battle the oxygen because there is no oxygen because nitrogen takes oxygen out of the, world, uh, out of the air. So it's the natural way of um, keeping the wines from, uh, from oxidizing at three o'clock in the morning, which is when I uh, get up um, and before obviously starting our harvest, we taste the previous harvest, make sure that um, we remember what we're working on. So I'm just walking through the cellar towards the, uh, towards the press, which is right here. Okay, don't move, just gonna turn on next for light. Back again. So the grapes come here into the cellar. For the white grapes, they go to the press and we press them and we ferment the juice. For the red grapes, they go, I'm not sure if you can see that on the, on the Zoom, but way up there, there's this hose that goes straight off. And obviously the red grapes, this is where the difference is between white wine and red wine. White grapes go to the press, they get pressed and they ferment the juice. Red grapes, they continue on their journey and they go to any of the fermentation tanks because they ferment as grapes. And we press them after the vindication. So now in the case in the case of our white, I'm sorry, of our red medium bois in my glass, we will probably use one of these, one of these, these tanks. So these are the old um, fermentation tanks, which date back to the uh, ooh, middle of the 1900s. And they're made of concrete. Um, there, there was a problem in the days where concrete and wine, they didn't like each other that much because Concrete is porous, wine is acidic, and it kind of didn't match very well. But then they invented this very simple way of refinishing the inside of the tank with either epoxy or stainless steel. So all these tanks have been refurbished inside, and they also have been fitted with, well, obviously with new stainless steel hoses and doors and, and all that, but they also have um, cooling inside. So the walls are about about this thick and to ferment wine in that it's absolutely brilliant because um, the walls being so thick we can get a really good um, uh, grip on the temperature of the fermentation so that, that is um, where we will ferment the, um, the grapes. So the, the Minabua Red that we're chasing tonight 2018 is about 60% uh, Syrah and about 40% Grenache and we will also ferment those at different separately because the Syrah will come in probably a couple of weeks before the, the Grenache and so they will go in different fermentation tanks and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to keep those grapes from fermenting. Um, that's a little bit what I was talking about uh, outside when the grapes are destemmed. We, we don't use sulfides at this stage at all because we're going to try and not have the grapes ferment and for that we have this very special yeast type that is um, uh, kind of useless because it doesn't ferment, but the only thing it does kind of multiply itself 
by multiplying itself, it's going to stop all the wild teenage that is in the cellar to get into the, to keep those grapes from fermenting. And it allows us to do what we call a cold maceration. And a cold maceration for us is extremely important because we harvest our grapes when they are really, really ripe. So you have the ripeness of a grape is often determined just by its uh, sugar, sugar, sugar content. Um, so they will take an analysis and they say, okay, if we harvest this today, it's going to make 13 or 13 half percent uh, alcohol. But for us, that is not quite enough because we're looking at what we call the phenolic maturity. The phenolic maturity is when the, what we call the polyphenol, the polyphenol are three things. It is the aromas, the um, tannins, and the coloring agent, which are all in the skins. And if those are ripe, then we consider a grape to be ripe. But if they're not ripe, that means you don't have a lot of aromas, it means you don't have a lot of tannins, so you don't have a lot of color. But because we're in the south of France, it's always quite warm, we have to wait a little bit um, until the polyphenol, what we call the phenolic maturity, is there. And while we're waiting to do so, obviously the sugar continues to climb, and we obviously uh, often have to match wines that are quite high in alcohol for us. So the Minervois is 14.5% uh, on the label, probably a little bit more close to 15%, but it's not a claim to fame for us. It's, it's, it's really something that we're trying to, to achieve purely to get the polyphenol, huh? the, the aromas, the tannins, and the color in the, in the grape skins to be, to be right. And for us, if they are not right, we cannot make a wine that is, uh, that is really um, full of fruit and full of soft and gentle tannins. The problem, however, is that when we do harvest those grapes with the right phenolic maturity, then often the alcohol is quite high. So as I was saying, 14 and a half, 15, sometimes you get in Grenache with maybe uh, 16, 16 and a half percent, quite big, big um, alcohol degrees. Not necessarily something we're looking for, but a, a necessary evil for us to get that phenolic maturity. So that is why we're using this um, special technique where we have these very special yeast cells that stop the wine from fermenting. And it will actually allow us to stop the wine from fermenting for maybe a week. And there's a huge reason behind that is that we're trying to balance the huge potential alcohol degree uh, of 15 or more with a lot of fruit. Because during this cold maceration, um, the wine will extract a lot of fruit and a lot of body. But the grapes at that stage, they don't yield any um, tannins because the tannins come out of the skins when there is an alcoholic environment. So when we stop it from fermenting, we only um, get fruit and, and, and body. And so we're trying to balance the fruit and the, and the, and the alcohol because wine is all a question of, um, of, uh, of balance. So the first thing we're gonna do when those grapes come into the cellar is gonna just try and stop it from fermenting because we don't want it, we want it to balance itself out and sort of make this Call it like a, a marinade of, of your lovely piece of lamb before you want to cook it. We want to get all the aromas out of the grapes before we just launch it into its fermentation. So this is a technique we've been using for about um, four years now. It's called uh, bioprotection. So we protect the grapes from fermenting with these special yeast cells and extract a huge amount of, um, of aromas before the uh, fermentation actually starts. So we do that for about four, five, six, seven days. And then the fermentation, we will let it start. So the, the sugar will start transforming itself in alcohol and, um, and, uh, and CO2, so, so, so bubbling. So the alcohol will push all the solids to the top of the vat. And it's our battle to push them down again, because we want to make sure that the solids of the grapes are in the juice rather than on top of the juice, because the juice needs to extract all its goodness out of the uh, out of the grapes, and um, that will go on for probably say about two weeks. Um, huge amount of work. You can make wine making as as complicated as uh, as you want, and we like it really complicated. So you do two push downs of the cap per day to to get all this goodness out of the out of the skins, 
and, and then basically the wine is wine and the alcohol has, um, has been created and the sugar is no longer there. So what happens is that the solids that were being pushed upstairs, they are now falling down because there's no more fermentation and obviously therefore no more um, CO2 being created. And then it's a question of pumping out the juice, so, which is no longer juice, which is wine. So we pump out the wine and then on a tank like this, so this is, if you look up there, that's 378 hectoliters. So that's um, 37,800 liter tank, um, in which we will probably put around 30 tons of one particular grape. And you can imagine that once, once the fermentation is finished, all the solids fall down, we pump away the juice, and then we're left with uh, probably this much, um, of, of grapes that are still in there, full of juice and full of wine um, that we have to shovel out. So a pump comes out right here and two guys, probably myself, will go in and we basically shovel it out. And that's where the red wine gets pressed after the fermentation. So the, the wine we pump out is what we call the vin de goutte. So that goes straight into a tank uh, next door. It's the best quality. Then all these grapes that are left in there, they um, they have to be pressed because they, they still are full of uh, full of juice. So we have this pump and it gets pumped to the press um, where it is uh, pressed to um, become what we call the vin de presse. So it's a little bit more solid uh, quality. Also, maybe um, a quick word on the press. Um, I mentioned the white wines; they get pressed before their um, uh, fermentation and the red wines get pressed after the fermentation. The press is, is kind of one of my favorite toys. It's, um, uh, it's the Rolls Royce of the press. It's made in Germany. Um, it's kind of like a not Rolls Royce, more like a Mercedes. Um, it is what we call pneumatic press. It is uh, a long cylinder, as you can see here. <clears throat> And half of the cylinder is, is, is an airbag. So it presses against the other half of the cylinder where we have a system of drains. And the great thing about that is that that airbag, we can blow up as much as we want. So if we put a little bit of pressure on it, we will get certainly less juice, but we get only the finest juice out of those grapes. You can imagine if you, if you, um, if you chew on a grape and you really chew on the pips, you'll get this kind of bitterness and this taste that we extract out of the pips. So you can imagine if we put a huge amount of pressure on the, on the press, which is the more classic presses um, that are still very much used, you will extract all those tenons out of the pips and the skins. And by using this very gentle airbag, um, we can only, uh, we only extract the, the, the very finest, uh, finest juices uh, out of the, out of the um, grapes. All right. So, Vinification, pressing, and then it goes for the Minervor Red. And then you've been maybe seeing a lot of barrels, but the Minervor Red actually has no oak whatsoever. Um, it's a wine that we mature 100% in either stainless steel or in concrete tanks. It's a, it's a wine that for us is. Um, uh, a style that where we really want the grape to talk and the fruit to express itself. Um, I like oak. It's, um, it's something that is, uh, can be really attributed to wine. But in this case, which is actually almost more difficult than putting wine on oak, to, um, to really allow the wine to, to express itself without any complementary uh, flavors like, like, like oak, oak maturing. Um, so what we're looking for in the 2018 uh, Minervois well, or in, in any Minervois well of this uh, particular level is really to get that really juicy um, structure, the, the fruit. Um, fruit is mainly oriented on uh, the black fruit, um, what we call uh, um, blackberries, um, black currants, uh, a lot of cassis. The cassis is mainly coming from the uh, uh, Syrah, the the, the black berries, mûr, 
is uh, is mainly the, the the Grenache. Try to get that blend. There will also be a little bit of um, of violet, uh, uh, violet, which is very much uh, uh, the the, the um, uh, Syrah oriented, and also some some spice, some peppery spice, and to to try and capture that fruit which we've tried to extract during the um, um, cold soak of the uh, fermentation, before the fermentation. I always find it a shame to then put it into oak because I really want to um, want to make sure that, that it's the fruit that is uh, talking. And also during that cold soak, we extract a lot of body. So you have a huge weight, a huge structure. You've got lovely tannins, you've got big body, big, big um, structure, and a lot of fruit. So on this wine, no, um, no oak. All right. Okay, I need to taste it because my throat is really dry and I'm very thirsty. Are there any questions in the meantime? Actually, the 2018 is, is tasting really, really nicely right now. Um, the, the, it's quite interesting because between what um, we are bottling and what has been shipped to uh, to Canada, there's always a year of uh, um, how is it, a, a decalage. Right? So we we shipped our 18s to Canada last year, and we're now actually on to the uh, to the 2019. Um, so it's actually very interesting to to taste it again, and it's um, it's showing really well. Actually, Michael made a made a point. Um, Earlier is that he tried the 2009 when we were on a on a conference call uh, last week, and uh, he, he, before he did that, he said, "Well, what is the aging on a on a on a Mina um, uh, like? What, what, what should we what, would, what should we advise people to to um, to sell their Mina Bois Chateau Canet for?" And in fact, the um, we, so what my answer was is that we, we took over uh, Canet in 2007, so that's now 13 years ago. Obviously, we have our first bottles uh, still in, uh, in a few corners uh, of, the, of the center. And I haven't tried any of the wines of two, since we've been here, so 2007, that, that are completely off and say, okay, you know, this is it. That they, they, they've had it. Because we're in a terroir that has got a lot of fruit, a lot of structure, and it, it really has everything to, um, to to age for a long time. So right now we're we're 13 years down the road since we've been here, and, and you know these wines are still going strong. But then that's also when wine becomes uh, quite personal. I like to try, for example, this the 2018. I just love to try it right now because it, it's got a lot of fruit. It's got that really juicy, dense blackberry, blackcurrant fruit. Uh, with a little bit of spice, a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a kick on the tannins without being overly harsh. But if you like a wine with more what we call the secondary fruits, when those very blackberry, blackcurrant fruits become more jammy and more prunes and a little bit more of a, what we call the, 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 the jammy fruits, you know, you've got years, years to go without um, hesitating. No problems uh, to to keep those wines in, uh, in your setup for a for a long time. So I can say to everybody that the uh, the O nine was just so vibrant and wonderful and and softer than the eighteen that we're doing today. Um, or what am I? I've got the seventeen, the two thousand seventeen today, and it was just beautiful. It, it had it's it's better. It's not diminished in any way. Yeah, no, they they, they definitely. Uh, can uh, can hang in there. So because there are some other wines that we that we will put on oak. There's a whole stack stack, stack of oak right here. Um, oh look look who's coming in. There's uh, there's my bride. Good evening, everybody. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Canet, so Victoria, who, oh, and even a dog coming oh, by. Hi, Hello, Mel. Um, and um, so we're talking about the uh, 2018 uh, Minervois. And this is the uh, the driving force uh, behind uh, behind me, and uh, keeps me focused uh, um, really on my on the uh, important stuff. Also, it's all for here, unfortunately, today. 
Question. Oh, um, I think Kathy, you had a question. Would you like to unmute yourself? No question. There we go. Yeah, it's actually not Kathy. It's Les. Um, last July, Hi, you had Les. Hi, how are you? Good, <laughs> good, to, good to see you guys. Good, good to see you too. We can't wait to get back. We missed the summer. I know. <laughs> we hope soon. <laughs> last summer, you had that incredible heat wave in July. Have you noticed that? Uh, has it affected your wine, your 2019 wines, do you believe? Um, it, it, you know what, we're, we're incredibly lucky. Um, it's a very good question. Um, and even in 2018, it was a little bit the same, to be honest. I mean, it, it's, um, we are in the most westerly part of the, of the Minervois, which has two huge advantages for us. Is that one is it allows us to make a really good white wine. Um, because being in the westerly part of the um, the Bois means that we're dominated by the uh, Atlantic winds, whereas most of the Bois is dominated by the uh, easterly winds coming from the Mediterranean, which are very hot and humid, which is difficult from a, a viticultural perspective because the um, uh, the hot, humid winds bring quite a few. Um, uh, fungi diseases like powdery and downy mildew. So that's something that's really, really difficult to battle. And it's something we have to, although we're on a sustainable grief, it, 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 it's, it's tough. Being as far westerly, in the most westerly part next to Carcassonne, uh, really, the Minerva stops pretty much where we are at. And therefore being dominated by the um, westerly winds from the Atlantic, they're a lot cooler and a lot drier. And that dry, cool wind uh, has really saved us um, uh, many, many times. And in 2018, we were also saved by a couple of rain, uh, rain showers. We actually had one two days ago, which is the one we had in 2018 as well, which is, is kind of a lifesaver because right now the, the heat is fairly intense. But like two days ago, we had a, we had a rain shower of maybe 10, 15 minutes. Water. Not a huge amount, but it just sees the grapes through for another couple of weeks, couple of months, no, not couple of months, couple of weeks, and then hopefully pray that we will have another one, maybe um, in two weeks from now, and it, it really, really sees the, the grapes through to the um, through the end. And in 2018, which was fairly similar to um, to to this year, is we had very wet spring, and then extremely dry summer. And um, so they had the reserve in the, in, in, in the ground water level to, to go quite a long way. But then you do see that they get to suffer a little bit um, um, in, in July and August. And with those couple of little rain showers, we just kind of jump over the fence and, and give, them, uh, give them what they need until, they, uh, until we harvest them. So I think similar to 2018, we're gonna be looking at fairly uh, uh, early, early harvest. Um, we're uh, in two weeks. Yeah, oh. pretty well. <laughs> I mean, normally we would be thinking about coming to Canada right now, but <laughs> unfortunately, with everything that's going on, it's difficult. Um, and also, yeah, we're, we, we, I'm thinking that we'll be harvesting our first grapes, which is Sauvignon, which is the, always the, the first to, to go. I'd say definitely in the middle of, uh, of August. Thank you. Well, thank you. Pleasure. So, Should we go down? I don't. Has Forrest taken you to the barrel cellar yet? Not yet. Should we? Let's, should we head that way? Let's head that. So these are these are all barrels that um, we're using for for grapes for grapes sorry for wines like the uh, the the family reserve. So the family reserve is pretty much a, a, a spin off of the um, of the of the Minervois. And as I said, in the middle of what we have no oak whatsoever. Well, I do like a little bit of oak. So we add pretty, to, the, to the same blend of 60% Syrah and 40% Grenache, we add about 30, 25 to 30% um, uh, of uh, oak matured um, Syrah. 
and it just gives that not necessary new oak. There's a little bit of new oak here. Um, this is this is Miles. Say hi, Miles. Miles is our is our semi dog. So we have a little bit of new oak, but we don't want to to put too much new oak in it because um, I really don't want it to become overpowering. So 25, 30 percent of oak, but there's some two years, some three year old barrels, just to because wine is in a barrel. It's not just a matter of adding oak to the to the mix. It's it's also the wine will breathe through the barrel and and it will therefore be in contact. It's what we call the micro-oxygenation. And, and, and just getting the little bit of air, it will enhance its aromatic complexity. Actually, we have to fill them up every week because when it breathes, it also evaporates a little bit of wine. It's what we call the, the part des anges. We uh, don't know how to translate that. But Angel's we'll, share. Angel's share, there we go, thank you, Sean. Um, and and it, it, will, it will be really just ever so much more concentrated and that's what we do with the, the Feminine Reserve. So that's the difference between the, the Minervois, which is purely fruit driven, and the, um, uh, and the, and the Feminine Reserve, which is partly on the. So then we go on, we get to these little weird contractions. Um, so actually, they come from close to, uh, to you. So they're, they're flex tanks. And we import them from uh, from the U.S. And the principle behind this is that you might have seen in the offering that there, there is a, um, a, a wine called La Chapelle. La Chapelle is our one of our two high-end cuvées. Um, high-end because all the effort we put behind them, and also because they have extremely small yields. So, for example, the the Minervois can officially produce 48 hectoliters to the hectare, so it's 4,800 4, liters to one hectare, which is 100 by 100 meters. We actually are not at 4,800 4, liters, we are more like 3,500, so 35 hectoliters to the hectare. Um, because that way we get the concentration, the volume, and the, and the, and the, the structure we want. These wines we're more looking at anywhere between 15 and 20 hectoliters to the hectare. So it's extremely concentrated, it's very small production. And for the Chapelle, which is Grenache, the, the Chapelle Grenache, we put it on these on these flex tanks because the thing about here we got a bottle, this is what it looks like. I wish it was open. My wife sorry. is being very strict when she gives me an empty bottle and, and, and sorry for um, That's right. <laughs> um, the Chapelle is, um, is, a, is a Grenache, extremely ripe Grenache. So I was talking about the, the knowledge maturity earlier. Grenache is, is very much the case. It needs to be ripe. So I'm not sure what we put on the back label. I haven't got my glasses on, but it says 15%. It's probably. Uh, what does it say, Shari? 15. 15. Uh, I probably lied a little bit. It's probably a little bit higher than that. Because Grenache is, 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 is really important for it to be properly ripe to express itself. And it's got huge fruit. And the lovely fruit about the, the Grenache is, 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 is the blackberries. I really love the blackberries. La Mure, as you say in French. But because it's such a big, Big body, it's a big structure. If we would put it in oak, you would hide that behind a wall of vanilla and, and toasted um, toasted notes of, of the oak. So instead, we put it in these flex tanks, which have exactly the same porosity as um, as a, as an oak barrel. So it has the maturing effect of a barrel, but not the oak. So it's something we've been using for. I don't know, three, four years now, and um, it's worked out really, really well. The fact that they're in the shape of an egg is that that's the ultimate um, shape for for wine to be matured in. Um, it's uh, from a, a convection movement perspective that it works real. So tiny, tiny volume. So the, the Chapelle, which you have in your offering, in a mixed case between another wine we made called the Gemochi, which we're going to look at right now, 
this is it. This is the, the two, the two, um, the two eggs here. Um, so yeah, we're looking at uh, total production of maybe uh, 3,400 bottles. All right, let's go on to the the next uh, next phase. It's a little bit darker. I hope you can hope you can still see it. Um, so this is where we have the um, the other cuvee, the high end cuvee, of our little um, hobby wine, as I often call it. It's called Les Evangiles. So contrary to the the previous wine, La Chapelle, this is uh, um, is a wine that um, is a hundred percent. Here we go. So this is this is his his brother, um, Les Evangiles, and whereas La Chapelle was Grenache, this is Syrah. And it's really interesting because we put the two of them in a mixed case um, for this offering specifically. And I'll, I'll also have a quick taste because I'm really thirsty. Um, on three different kind of barrels. So we have new oak, one-year-old barrels, and we have two-year-old barrels. The reason why we don't put everything on new oak is that it would be too much. It would be overpowering. You'd be just looking at notes of uh, torrefaction, like, like mocha and, and, and vanilla. And as the barrels age, they will lose a little bit of their power to transmit flavors to the, to the wine, but they don't lose the ability to um, to have micro oxygenation and let the wine breathe. So this is a, a one-year-old barrel. Now I know this is really unfair. Okay, sorry, but it's really good. <laughs> I'm really enjoying that. So what we'll be doing is that um, so this is the 2019. We took the 2018 of barrel, which is what we will be shipping to you um, in two months from now. Actually, so we're getting very, very close. So we took, so we took it off barrel. You can see the empty barrels. <coughs> um, probably maybe two weeks ago, and so I like to leave it into a. So we blend these three different ages of barrels. We blend them together in a in a tank, a very small tank, and um, and then we we bottle it most of the time, like a month or two months afterwards. So let let it sit into a tank for for a couple of uh, couple of weeks, couple of months, to um, to kind of assimilate and get uh, get all the uh, oak flavors sort of blended together. Mm. I'm good for this. Mm. Because after all, why why do you do this if you can't drink it and share it with everyone? There you go. So uh, hopefully you'll all have a chance to taste it one day. Well, there you go. That's a little little tour through the cellar. What haven't been seen? Um, you can go have a quick look at the bottling line. Where does anyone have any questions? Does anybody have any questions in the meantime? Hi, Floris. It's uh, Colette here. How are you? Hi, Colette. How are you doing? Good, good. Gosh, Thank it's you. been a while. I know, I know. And now we're day Hi, drinking. Hi, Colette. <laughs> Hi, Victoria. Too, too, too long. <laughs> we certainly miss you guys. Bad, bad influence on you. Bad influence. So you were talking briefly about your when you have barrels and then you do some blending. So how many times do you try different sort of amounts to to get it to where you want it to? Like what, do you start with a certain ah. when you blend wines? And from, a, from a blending perspective? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's quite interesting. So, okay, let's, let's, let's walk quickly this way. Sorry. <laughs> no, so this, this is, this is, this is what it, one of the most important uh, moments is that, so this is, okay, not the most commercial thing to show you, but this is this is a little bit my 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 what we call our lab, which is really ugly and and not very organized. And but I'll show you two things. 
that are very important is this and this. So it's a micro pipette and a little what we call éprouvette. And basically what happens is, is that for the two, for when the wines are, are ready, you basically get samples. So we don't make one Sina, we don't make one Grenache. We have, um, if we're looking at the 2019, which we'll be blending for your uh, Minervois 2000, and, sorry, for your Minervois offering, um, uh, we will be using the 2019. At this moment I have, three or four Syrah and probably three Grenache. So the next thing, you're always a little bit our, um, how would I say, precursor, or you're, you're our, our, the first um, uh, client for whom we will be shipping 2019 uh, Minervois. Uh, it just kind of works out that way. And, and it's, it's really cool actually, because it, it, it pushes us to sit down and also these are wines that are, wines that we've been following and there's a recipe that we have in our mind and I'm saying earlier 60% Syrah, 40% Grenache, but we don't have one Grenache, we don't have one Syrah, we've got lots. So we really have to sit down and it's something actually we did last week because a lot of people are going left and right and we really know exactly, uh, I can show you the tanks if you want, exactly what we are, uh, what we're going to go blend. But although we have this recipe, that is kind of standard, and you know your vineyards, you know this vineyard and that vineyard, those make the, the, the best Syrah and the best Grenache. We, we sort of know which, which, we're, which ones we're gonna do, but every year, because every vintage is different, the years are different, the, the, the climate. Oh, I'm getting a bit of a um, the, um, the, the climate is different, so every year is um, an adaptation of where do you wanna go and, and, and how are you gonna, make your blend and so we stand here with myself there's natalie our state manager she is also a certified enologist as is pierre he's also a knowledgeist pierre is our technical director and then we have a consultant knowledge so this the four of us and um, we always the consultant knowledgeist is not because we don't know what we're doing it's just we want to make sure that we get our head out of off the barrel as we say instead of something else um and to make sure that we are not completely blindfolded by our own wines, which is extremely important because you taste these wines all the time, all the time, and you know, for you, they're the best wines ever. So we get an exterior guy, which is extremely talented. He's an agriculture and an engineer and a, and a, an, an ologue, which is a French wine making um, term. And um, together, so he's sort of the exterior factor with also the brief saying, okay, this is what we're doing, but I'm kind of all about looking what wine making, what, what wines we're making. But the exciting part of running a show like this is that I want to make it better every year. So I don't want to just sort of say, okay, last year was really cool, let's do it again. No, let's see what we can do to make it better and look at different techniques. So we've imported a huge amount of different um, uh, ideas from different countries. My, my, it, how to say it, my, my, um, my advantage and my disadvantage is that I'm not, compared to some of my peers around me, my neighbors, I'm not the second, third, or tenth generation winemaker from a, from a French winemaking family, um, which means that I don't have my father, grandfather, great grandfather, and so forth to explain to me how it's done and, and, and help me um, in applying those, those wonderful winemaking techniques, including the, the, the experience they have. Um, so that's a disadvantage. The advantage, however, is that I don't have them telling me, it's like, oh, you're doing it differently than we are doing. How come? Isn't it good enough what we did? And, and it allows me also to be extremely open-minded and to, to go and look for, for, for new opportunities to be reported nano technology from from New Zealand, Victoria is home country, um, which is because a lot of people have been using micro oxygenation, which I find very cool. Um, so we've been using some nano technology for nano oxygenation to in, enhance the, the fruit of the wine with extremely small doses of micro oxygenation. 
run our oxygenation. Um, we also have been using those techniques of um, um, bioprotection that I was talking about. So every year is a new priority basically for that. Sorry, it's a very long answer to your question. Thank you, I appreciate and then, it. I think Carl had a question and also Scott and Tara were wondering about the Minerva Blanc. The Minerva Blanc, yeah, let's go and have a look at the Minerva Blanc. I love a glass yeah. of Minerva Blanc. Hey, Boris, it's Carl. Wait, Carl. Hi, Carl. How are you? Good. So uh, I had a question. Oh, I can't uh, hear you, but I know you're there. Yeah, I had a 2018 last night. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so, and uh, I lo thought it was lovely. But I had a little question on the back. The label, the original label had 13.5%, and then they had to add a little label that said 14.9. Uh, what would have happened there? So on the back it says 15.5? No, it said 13.5. And then, of course, when it got to Ontario, they made sure that it had the right alcohol, so it went up to 14.9. So was there an error in the printing or? Probably. Well, 13.5 on, on, on my Minervois is, you know, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be right, as I was saying earlier. No. That. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I think, actually, you know what, you saying that, I, I remember. Remember that I got dinged by uh, by the LCBO because there was an error in the label. Oops. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah, and the, just from Scott and Tara, they said yeah, thirteen point five. I think once we blend the um, the Syrah with the so the Syrah will be around fourteen, and the, the Grenache will be more like fifteen, fifteen and a half. So analytically, will probably be more like. Um, yeah, well, I, I suppose that um, because the, the LCBO analyzes uh, all the uh, wines when they come in. Um, and uh, I think I, uh, I got my, uh, my wrist uh, slapped because I always take a little bit of artistic freedom, but they didn't appreciate that. <laughs> Fortunately, in a lot of other provinces, they don't do anything, so. <laughs> oh, good. There you go. There yeah. you go. Thanks. Yeah. Pleasure. Yeah. Mina for Blanc. All right. Let's go and have some Mina for Blanc. So I'm keeping some Minervois Blanc, especially for a premium, and it's not a lot left, and it's right here. <clears throat> we haven't, um, well, we have bottled everything except, except this. The Minervois Blanc is, uh, is a little bit of our speciality. There you go. So I got... 26 hectoliters left, um, it's all ready to go. Um, Minervo Blanc is 3% of, uh, of the production in, uh, in Minervo because we're in the south of France, it's hot. The grapes, they ripen very, very quickly. Alcohol goes up through the roof. Acidity goes down when the alcohol goes up, obviously. And, um, it's just, it's not an easy product to make in, uh, in the south of France. We're not in Burgundy, it's, 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 it's complicated. Because of our positioning, what I said earlier, we're in the most westerly part of the, uh, of the Mina Bois. And so we're influenced by this dominating wind um, from the west, from the Atlantic, which is a cool wind. It allows us to make uh, a very decent white Mina Bois uh, because we keep some of the acidity, we keep some of the freshness, which is so incredibly important for, uh, for, for white wines. Um, so whereas the region makes 3% white wines, we actually make 30% white wines. It's a little bit of a speciality for us. So don't all start ordering white vino, well, because I don't have a lot less. <laughs> but um, no, we, we do. We um, keep it in standard here. It's a blend of uh, Roussan, um, Vermentino, we have a little bit of um, Bourboulinc, which is a very local grape, and a little bit of um, Muscat. But Muscat results to, is, is only maybe 3-4% because I like Muscat, but I don't want it to kind of... Um, I don't want it to, to, to show its head. I don't want it to taste like, like Muscat. As soon as I taste the Muscat for me, it's already too much. But then also what we put in is... 20%, and you're not allowed to tell anybody this, you put in 20% of Viognier, which is actually not a grape variety that is allowed 
in the Minervois Appalachian. The Appalachian Minervois is actually talking to, um, to the ENO, Institut National d'Appalachian des Origines, to have the, the Viognier accepted in the, in the Appalachian uh, Minervois, but it's an ongoing process and to change those laws, it takes about 10 years. So I kindly kind of anticipated the 10 year decision down the road to start putting in it because I love Minervois and to have a little bit of, uh, so I love uh, Viognier, to have a little bit of Viognier which enhances the, the um, apricot, the lychee, the kind of tropical aroma in the blend, it's, it's absolutely delicious. Can you please ask me if it's very dry? 100% dry. So all our wines are 100% dry. Um, that doesn't mean that they're usually fruity and, and very luscious, but yeah, no, so for, for wine to be dry, it means that we ferment all the, uh, all the sugars and that there's less than two grams of sugar per liter um, in, in the end result. So we have no residual sugar. Um, so yes, this is a very dry, crisp wine, but it's quite interesting because sometimes um, people say, me, oh, you're mean of wine, it almost tastes sweet. And that's just purely because it's so incredibly fruity. It's, it's very much um, uh, apricot, lychee. There's a lot of exotic kind of maybe tropical fruit. It's got some pineapple. It's, um, it's, it's, it's a lovely one. The only, only white Minervois that was awarded a gold medal in Paris this year. So it's uh, uh, a competition that is, um, for me, it's quite important because it's organized by our um, uh, Ministry of Agriculture. So no cheating. It's just they come to the center, they pick up the wine, say, okay, we'll judge them. So got, it's the only one white mean of one that got a gold medal there. And it just um, received 87 points by Mr. Parker. So pretty good for us. Uh, if I may, I'd like to say it's a very elegant uh, and it's lively and fresh um, and very long in the mouth. And it is great on a summer's evening all by itself or it stands up because it has a lot of structure. It stands up uh, to being served with a, with a nice chicken and cream sauce if you want, or most recently I paired it with some fresh courgettes filled with goat's cheese and olive oil. And it's delicious. So, okay. Well, I get to eat all that. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Go ahead. I recognize that voice. Hi, Vic. Hi, I don't know. I just have a question. I really like the Chardonnay that Vicky uh, was named for Vicky that we had in last year's uh, opinion offering. And I'm wondering what uh, you would suggest this year to uh, to take that place, whether it's the oh, Fleur de Charlotte Chardonnay or the okay. Domaine so so Charlotte is now pointing at herself saying, eh, Fleur de Charlotte, Fleur de Charlotte. But um, actually, if I, yeah, sorry, Charlotte, but if I'm honest with, uh, with you, Sandra, it's um, um, the Domaine d'eau uh, Chardonnay is probably, um, sh she's looking at me right now. I think she's going to drop the camera and it's going to go. We the love Domaine you, Fleur de Charlotte. Here, I'll show you. Here, come, Charlotte. If you, if you, oh, she might not fall out. Oh, well. Anyway, the Domaine d'eau Chardonnay is um, it's a new, new venture we have since two years. Um, it's um, uh, so it's a vineyard we bought in um, in Limoux, and the really interesting thing about Limoux is that it is. Um, um, do I try to find it, it's um, a lot higher than where it's. It's really in the Piedmont of the uh, of the period, so it's about forty minutes from here. And um, oh, sorry, I just really try and try the wine while I'm talking about it because otherwise it looks kind of uh, as if I'm making this up. <laughs> I miss that. It's only ten o'clock at night, and I haven't tried any wine at all today. Um, so, um, 400 meters high, whereas right here we are more like 80 meters above sea level. So, you're really in the foothills of the Pyrenees, Pyrenees. And that means that, as I was saying, and I was raving about the um, Atlantic influences that we have in the Minervois for our white Minervois, 
there we are even much, much more into that. And so it's a much cooler climate and it actually allows us to do, if I'm getting very technical, it allows us to do a malolactic fermentation. So the malolactic fermentation is a transformation of the malic acids into lactic acids. Something very much done in Burgundy and Chablis and so forth. But not at all done in the south of France because whatever acidity we have in our wines, we want to keep it because malolactic fermentation will reduce the acidity. So we do it on all our reds, but not on the whites because on the whites, we want to keep that acidity, that freshness, that, that sort of zing. Um, so we will block it by reducing the temperature after the fermentation to not have those the little malolactic fermentation, which is a total nat natural process uh, happen. Um, so we, on the, on the Mina Bois Blanc, we would stop the malolactic fermentation to happen to keep the acidity um, and the freshness. But on a wine like the, the, the Domaine de Chardonnay, we will allow it to have its um, malolactic because the acidity, because of its terroir being so much higher, um, is, is much higher. And so we, here we go. Well, this is the Domaine d'eau. Um, so we have two, two wines. Actually, this is a Pinot, but we have a Chardonnay and a Pinot Noir. Um, because we lived in, uh, in Burgundy for about 16, 17 years, I think. 17, 17 so, years. So 17 years in Burgundy left us with the desire to make some Burgundian style wines. Um, and so we bought this vineyard and launched our son Oliver um, to, um, to make to make a go of it. And you know, he was born in the Hospice de Bonne in, uh, in, in Burgundy, in Bonne, and then he grew up in the south of France. So Domendo is a little bit uh, uh, a blend of his, uh, of his upbringing between Burgundy and, uh, and, uh, and the south of France. And the most Burgundian terroir in the south of France, the only place where you can make a decent Pinot or a lovely crisp but still very complex Chardonnay is, is, is in uh, um, Uyuni. And so that's, this is a little Burgundian answer to, um, to, uh, to the south of France. And uh, we're sending some bottles to our friends in Burgundy to just uh, give them a bit of a run for their money. We look forward to tasting it. Yeah, well, let me show you sh show you another one that um, because Charlotte is obviously now very uh, very upset. We do have another question, uh, one from Kim, I think. Hi, Kim. Jean. So th yeah. this this is this is this is um, just to make sure that Charlotte is a little bit less upset. <laughs> she, she has she has her name on a few bottles as well. <laughs> Um, Flores, you were, I have a question regarding the um, Bildo. How yeah. different it is from the uh, last year. Um, la last year was a, another, um, I don't remember, but it was other sparkling. From yeah, it was under the, was under the Canon label. So, so last year we, we did on the Canon label because we, were, we weren't quite ready with the, the vintage we bought in, uh, um, in, um, in Limoux. But basically, it's from the vineyards that we um, that we have in in Limou because Limou is um, um, obviously very well known for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, but it's also the birthplace of bubbly wine. So in fifteen thirty four, give or take a few years, I hope I'm not mistaken, but I think it's fifteen thirty four. There was um, uh, the monks of the um, the Abbey of uh, Saint Hilaire that invented. Uh, bubbly wine. So this is 150 years before um, uh, before champagne was even invented. So they're total copycats. Um, and so in the vineyards in Limoux of Domendo, we have um, uh, a grape variety called Mozac. And Mozac is the um, basis of the um, Blanquette, uh, Blanquette de Limoux. Blanquette de Limoux is Officially, it has to be 90% Mozac um, and 5%, well, we, we add 5% of Chardonnay and 5% of, uh, of Chenin. So Mozac is, a, is an interesting grape variety. I, I'll be really honest with you. If you vinify it as a, as a still wine, it's really not very good because it's got really fairly high acidity, but which it, what makes it perfect 
for making the base wine for sparkling wine. So it has exactly the same technique as, um, uh, as a champagne wine. So we make the base wine, fairly high acidity, not too high in alcohol, say 10%. And then we have the second fermentation on the bottle, like champagne, with the uh, Chardonnay and, um, and, uh, and, and Chenin. Oh, what I, what I also need to add to it is that that wine, the second fermentation is on, um, uh, on bottle, right? So then after you put it in the bottle and have the second fermentation, you need to leave it a minimum of nine months to be able to, so to, to let the, obviously there's a, a, a capsule on the bottle and it will ferment in the bottle and whereas in fermentation in tank, the bubbles, they, they, they can go away. In a bottle, obviously it can't and that's how the, the bubbles get absorbed into the, into the wine. You know, in this case, um, like it is with Cremant de Bourgogne, like Cremant de, de, de Limoux, you need to leave the wines for nine months to absorb the bubbles in the in the wine we leave them actually two years so 24 months and the difference is by leaving them for 24 months the bubble gets absorbed into the wine and becomes very fine and very that's it's, it's a very refined subtle bubble whereas if you do it for nine months it's quite aggressive it's like the difference between drinking perrier and and badois it's it's um the longer you leave it nobody does it because it's obviously very expensive to leave it for not for for two years rather than nine months but it really makes all the difference is it the first time it is offered the well it's the first time it's offered with opinion but yeah 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 well we did we did the fin, fin bulle de canet um last year for the first time but it was it was because we started making it but we hadn't got gotten our act together and now it's pretty much the continuancy of uh, of that same product but it's now properly on the, the domendo uh, uh, label which is the estate we, we, we bought in 2018 uh, so it's we weren't quite ready for you yet thank you we do have another question i think it's from colette actually sorry about that it was, uh, it was exactly the same. I, I wanted to know what the difference was between the Bleu de Canet and the uh, Domendo uh, Blanquette de Limon. So uh, you answered that question. So, uh, but I, I, I it's delicious. It's delicious one, really. It is. Here, one of my let favorites. me show you the bot bot bottling line. And how's Elliot? <laughs> Elliot, oh, here's Elliot. Actually. Ah. Hey, speaking of the devil, Elliot's getting a little older. He's 12 years old. There's Miles. Miles is only two years old. So, what's that? Elliot's still stealing. Elliot's still stealing. Elliot's still stealing. If you remember Elliot, he's still stealing baguettes off people's door. So here we are at a little bottling line. It's not a huge installation, but it's it's extremely uh, functional one. Fairly, uh, finely hand. So you can see tomorrow morning, seven o'clock, we're starting some little de Chardot. She's uh, quite the uh, the famous lady in uh, well, France, um, Japan, Scotland, where she's going to study soon. So that's quite quite handy, and um, Canada. So this is the bottling unit. And Floris. Yeah. Uh, can you also mention she's on airlines? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Charlotte is actually sorry, sorry, Charlotte, I did you wrong? She's also on uh, on business class of uh, Lufthansa. Not so popular right now, but uh, <laughs> no, yeah, no. She um, her wine is um, the the Chardonnay is on uh, on the. Uh, on the Lufthansa business class for a few years already. She's getting around to a little shy. So the idea, the idea behind Fleur de Charlotte and Domendo is to try and get our kids involved in, in our, in our business, but in their own right. So, so Charlotte, can I just take this for a second and can, okay. can we just turn the camera and you, you tell people what Hello. Fleur de Charlotte is right here. Let me just, there you go. Oh, am I good? Okay. Yeah. Um, so Fleur de Charlotte is essentially 
a kind of twist on the southern French wines, which, as my dad said, are very high alcohol and really good, as you're tasting right now. But they're just a bit more, um, the Fleur de Charlotte wines are more based on the fruit and the elegance. And it's really, we do completely um, stainless steel driven. So all the wines are aged in the tanks, which means that we really concentrate on fruit and each variety. And we extract all the specific tones in each different variety. So the Viognier, the Chardonnay, all have their specific um, flavors. So the Fleur de Chalette wines are kind of my way of going away from um, the southern, southern French wines, which tend to be quite big and delicious. Uh, whereas mine are a bit more fresh and fruity for the younger generations or the older who want something nice for the summer. So, yeah. There you go. Thank you, Charlotte. All right. So when we have a quick look at the um, this little beauty here, so this is the bottling line. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make sure, although the wines come straight from the factory, the bottles, I mean, they're there. They're all clean and sterilized. We're going to rinse them again. And then the big thing, before I won't bore you with all the technical details, is wine, when you bottle it, it, it is poured into a bottle and there's actually a lot of oxygen in the bottle. And so I'm getting back at my, my um, sulfites and my, my use of um, antioxidants is that when you, when you pour wine in, so this is the actual bottling unit. So this is where, where, this is where the bottle goes. And if the, if the wine falls into the bottle, there's a huge amount of oxygen in the bottle, which gets mixed with um, with the wine so that's what we call dissolved oxygen and to counter that we use sulfites to make sure that that wine's wine once we put it in the bottle and mix it with oxygen and put a cork in it it doesn't um, uh, oxidize within the next six months which is exactly what we don't want to do so we've added this machine um, which has two hoses a big one and a small one which have two dials one works on a negative pressure and one works on a positive pressure. So this big hose, every bottle that comes by, it, it gets sucked vacuum. And then in a split second, we are adding one and a half liters of um, nitrogen in the shape of gas under a pressure of 1.5 bar. So that means between, between here, the bottle, hang on, let me just get a bottle. The bottle from here goes to here oh, not the right size but um it, it, it is kind of overflowing with nitrogen so when it gets to this filling station it's still overflowing with nitrogen and that means that there's no oxygen in the bottle so if there's no oxygen in the bottle at the moment you put the wine in we don't need to put sulfites in so i'm not saying we put in zero sulfites but we put an absolute absolute minimum to make sure that um you know you can drink those two, three bottles a day, which is what we want you to drink. <laughs> and don't get a headache. All right. Are we still there? Awesome. So Florist, without telling us uh, what the wine is, I've just realized that you are the Founders' Choice uh, supplier this time. And wow. uh, so tell us about it without telling us about it. <laughs> wow. That's a bit of a difficult So the Founders' Choice this year is, um, I'm very glad that you, um, that you chose it as such, or that, yeah, that Jane, Jane singled it out. Um, it is a, it is a wine that um, is the first time I've made it. Um, not, uh, it's not the first. We've been trying, we've been dabbling with um, what we call maceration carbonique for the last three years. Um, it's a very difficult winemaking technique where we do a whole bunch of fermentation uh, uh, in, uh, in tanks that it's, um, it's, it's, uh, oh, it's a technique awesome. hand harvested whole bunch of fermentation where we, we set up the whole thing I'd said about the pre-fermentation maceration on the Minervois, 
is not a, not not at all applied here. We wanted to implement straight away a um, whole bunch of fermentation because it's what we call the intracellular intracellular um, fermentation. So that the grapes ferment from within and they kind of explode um, with the um, with the yes. fermentation and and the skin structure gets completely deteriorated by the fermentation from within the grape. Um, and it just extracts a huge amount of uh, flavor. It's, it's quite complicated. We can only make very small volumes because of that. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a hobby wine. Um, we've, we haven't, we've been, as I said, been experimenting with this for three years now. The results are great. We've started to switch all the um, chapelle to carbon, carbonic maceration. And um, we're also starting to switch the Minervois to partly carbonic fermentation. But now we've actually made this ultimate blend, which we've never done before, which is kind of cool, actually, um, between Syrah and Grenache of uh, carbonic maceration. So it's, it's um, yeah, it, I've never made it before. So it's not the wine that Chateau Canet has produced before. And uh, the funnest choice would be a little bit uh, the, the I'm just using you as a guinea pig. But let me tell you, the team in the cellar, so Natalie, Claire, and, and Forrest, um, and I, the team I'm allowed to, uh, are very, very excited about, about the results. They really, like, wow. They, and for them to get really, really excited about the wine that they work with every day is, uh, is wonderful to see. Well, we're well over a thousand subscription cases for founders now, so I hope you've got enough. Wow, that's quite yes. a lot. <laughs> that's, uh, well, that's, that's great. Well that's, done. that's pretty much all we made. Yeah. <laughs> great. Well, shall we wrap it up, or does anybody else have any questions? Uh, actually, I have a question. Yeah. Hi, uh, Floris. Hi. Hi, I, so I have a, my name is uh, Glenn, and uh, to, first I want to say that your uh, Minervois Blanc are fantastic. Ils adore, sont super, ils continuent. Merci beaucoup. Uh, my question is, how long would you recommend we could sell the Minervois Blanc? Minervois Blanc, that's interesting. So I was saying earlier the, um, uh, the Minervois Rouge, and, and Michael was drinking some 2009 last weekend, and. Uh, and they, they, they really hang in there. I actually personally think that uh, the Minervois Blanc is, is a wine that should be drunk uh, uh, well before that. It's, um, it's not a wine that I make to be settled for five or six years. Um, I, I think two, three years would be a, a, a nice age. Uh, we are actually personally drinking the 2019 right now because um, because we are not many producers of Minervois Blanc, uh, it sells out quite quickly. That's why I was joking that we were keeping that uh, tank uh, for for premium, but it's actually not a joke. It's, it's, it's literally all we have left. We actually have stopped selling uh, 2019 Minervois Blanc uh, uh, to all of our customers because we 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 are just reserving the last little bit of um, of uh, juice we have for uh, for premium. So. It, it is not a wine to, to age for, for many years. I would really suggest between two and three years. So, uh, Excellent. Merci encore. C'est un plaisir. Merci. Bonne fin de journée. Anybody else? Well, if you don't mind, Floris, I was just going to go through the line. Um, I, I know we're here for Minervois, but... Uh, just wanted to point out to everybody on the call that all the, the wines throughout the catalog, they are quite remarkable that you're able to hit all of these price points with, with such quality wine. And, and you know, it's rare for us at Opinion to be able to get wines at, at the price point of the Fleur de Cholette in sixes. So for me, it's really great that I can order some, some Merlot and, and some Rosé as well. Instead of getting 12 and 12, I get six and six. So I'm probably going to get four of the varietals for that one, and uh, and the O, and then the Minervois to in in that mid range, and I absolutely love it. I've got it for every almost every year since '09, and and then of course that mixed case is uh, 1977 is that mixed case of the uh, in a wooden case which I absolutely love. I always use those wooden cases after they're out of my cellar. I use them for Christmas gifts, and I give. A bottle of the wine that came from it with a couple of glasses and, uh, and oh, a decanter nice. in a wooden case and it always goes over exceptionally well but uh, so the La Chapelle and Les 
On va Gilles, is that how you're saying it? On va Gilles? Mon français n'est pas très bien. Le Évangile est le nom de la place, le nom de la vignette. Le Château Canet a été créé en 1148 par Bernard de Canet. Et donc, nous avons une vignette qui s'appelle Le Château, qui est là où le castle était. Et puis, à côté de ça, nous avons une vignette qui s'appelle La Chapelle. Nous avons une vignette qui s'appelle L'Église, nous avons une vignette qui s'appelle La Croix. Toutes les vignettes ont des noms. Of the of the um, the time, and then this the very highest one is called the Divangil, which which kind of dominates. It's totally very Catholic in those names. Um, yeah, so, so, so. it's our highest vineyard, and it has the most spectacular view over the whole valley of the Miabwa, um which is a real canopy of olive groves and cypress trees and pine forests, and obviously a lot of vineyards, but. The typicity of the Minerva is so interesting with, with the patchwork of landscape that we have here. So, if you haven't come to visit, come yeah. and visit. And, we can. and when welcome you here. I can promise everybody that Opimian will have a travel program again when it's allowed, and uh, and yeah. that you'll be one of the first on our list. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Michael, I, I also just wanted to add is that um, as, as as I said, it's 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 our wedding anniversary, but. It's, it's also another anniversary that this year is the 10th year that we've been working with, um, with the premium. And, um, you know, I've been in the wine business for 30 years. Uh, I know I look really young. But, um, <laughs> but uh, who's laughing? <laughs> that, that will be recorded. But, no, it, it is um, the Canadian market is, if you're in a wine business, is not the easiest market to work with. You know, you. The ten provinces, and you've probably got as many monopolies, and it's it's um, it's a difficult market. And sometimes I think that it actually penalizes the consumer as such. And ten years ago, I stumbled across premium actually thanks to my sister-in-law who's on this uh, on this call, which I thank you very much for introducing me to um, to premium way back when. And for these last 10 years, we've developed um, our, our dealings together. And I, I, I just love working with you because it's, it allows the Canadian consumer, i.e. the opinion member, to access wines that are not just uh, uh, sort of um, sought out by the, by the monopolies and just, just um, selected because of the budget that was behind it or so forth. And I, uh, I just, um, I, I think, I love what you, you kind of, um, I love the work you guys have been doing. And uh, so here's to all of right you. And happy thank anniversary you. and cheers and thank you. You are the strength of Opinion. Yeah. Thank you. Together. Cheers, cheers. Cheers. Bon fin de journée. Merci au revoir. Happy holidays. Happy anniversary. Happy. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary! Thank you! Bonsoir! 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 Thank you! Happy anniversary! Thank you! Hey, Floris! Uh, last question. Now you, you spoke about all these wines. Like, now I'm a little bit perplexed. I already got ordered Fleur de Chaleur, Chaleur. I, yes. I got a rosé and the, the Viennier again. <laughs> but now, what am I supposed to order? Les Envangers, Minerva again, the oh, well, Founders' Choice? Well, what am I, I doing? Think I, got, I, got a, I got a suggestion, it's like um, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll think about it, but... <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you Cheers, much. guys. I hope Cheers. to see you together. <laughs> well, stay safe. Just stay safe. Yeah. Stay safe, all. Bye, Miles. Bye. Bye.